In the previous videos on oscillations, the situations were all simplified in an important way. There was no consideration of friction or resistance somehow involved by <clears throat> moving through and about. And we know this ultimately can't be right. For example, you have a pendulum, you let it go, it swings back and forth, but you notice that it swings back less and less, weaker and weaker with time, and eventually it stops. So we need to make sure the setup we have can somehow account for these sorts of changes. So again, if we were to imagine, say, a pendulum swinging about some sort of starting angle, and it moves back and forth, but it goes through the air, and the air resists it to some degree. And you have probably noticed that media like air and water, the faster you go through it, the more resistance you get. So that it's not just a constant amount like we normally treat friction with some sort of surface where it's just constant no matter how fast you're moving along. So let's suppose that's the sort of setup we have, that we have some driving force that is the thing that's going to make it oscillate back and forth normally and we also have some sort of resistance. So to simplify this again, instead of the case of the pendulum oscillating back and forth, which was approximate and we had to deal with torques, let's consider the slightly simpler case. So we'll consider the case then of a spring and a hanging mass. And this way the only source of resistance for that mass is just the air that it's moving through up and down. So if we were to look at all the different forces acting on this setup, we would have the weight of the object, but that's going to actually just be a constant amount, and that'll just change the equilibrium position actually. So really the only forces that are going to be changing on us at all are going to be of two sorts. There's going to be the restoring force from the spring, and there's going to be a resistive force when we're going through the air. So we'll just say it has some constant value. B is that describes the fluid you're moving through, and then V is the velocity you're going through. And as we know, that that's supposed to equal mass times acceleration from Newton's second law. So if these are the forces that actually change with time on us, we should rewrite this equation, and we see it again, it's a differential equation, but a little bit more fun. So minus kx is equal to bx dot plus mx double dot. This is clearly a more complicated looking equation. And this one isn't going to be as simple to figure out. But we're not going to ask you to necessarily solve differential equations like this, but to show you the solution. And I will show you what a general solution would be, and you can plug into the equation see that that's right, and that can constitute a sort of a proof that if the position function is a function of time going up and down, if that were of the following form, that the amplitude will still come into play, and we'll still have the same sort of up and down oscillation, so the cosine function should still be there, but we need to also put in a function that shows how those oscillations will get weaker. And we'll see that that works if we have the exponential function, but it will be in the following form, that it will be negative b divided by 2m times time, and then that multiplied by cosine omega t plus phi, where phi again is that phase constant that kind of describes the initial position of the system. So here's what you'll notice that with the decay function here is that as time gets larger, this value up here becomes more and more negative, and e to something more and more negative gets closer and closer to zero. So that means these oscillations will have a smaller maximum value, and that's what you've seen in real life. We still, of course, have the actual oscillation portion here. Two other things to notice with this equation. The larger value b you have, the more quickly this will decay, which makes sense if you have more resistance, which is what b would represent here in this equation. Make b larger, it's a larger force. 
Well, in that case, it's going to suck the energy out of the system more quickly. Conversely, notice that mass is in this equation here. So the more massive the object, the slower the decay, which makes sense. If you have a really big mass, then you'd expect it to have more energy in the system, and you'd have to do more work to slow it down any significant amount. So, indeed, that actually at least fits conceptually what we would expect to have happen. But there's one other change. The value omega here is not the same omega that you saw before. Instead, it's going to have a different form, because the way we had omega before was just taking the spring constant dividing by mass, but we also now have that b value in there, so it makes it even more complicated. The way it works out is that omega now is defined as the square root of k over m, which you've seen before, minus b over 2m squared. And that k over m, like I say, that's what you'd seen before with omega, so we can also rewrite this as omega not squared minus b over 2m squared. So omega naught is then sort of the natural frequency. This is how it would oscillate if there weren't any resistance to it, but the oscillations are actually changed by the resistive force which again should make sense if you have, in this case, a rather large value of b, then there is going to be a much smaller angular frequency because now you're resisting the motion that's actually trying to drive the oscillations. So that makes, again, conceptual sense. And again, if the mass is really large, then the effect can be hardly noticeable. you're also going to notice that there are going to be some interesting uh, complications depending on what the value of b is. If b has the correct value, it could be the case that actually this square root would be 0, couldn't it? Worse though, there could be values of b large enough such that this square root would actually give us an imaginary result. These sorts of cases would be what we call in the first case, if this comes out to be 0, a critically damp system, and if b over 2m is too large, an overdamp system, and then it gets um, a little bit more screwy. Most of the times, though, we're just going to be considering the what we call underdamped system, where this value is positive, so that way we're taking the screw to something positive, and we're going to get the sort of oscillations that we might more likely expect. But friction is hardly the only thing we might consider. After all, if you're, say, on a swing set, you know that if you have somebody behind you pushing you on every time you're uh, coming back up, you can get some very large oscillations. So we should also consider the case of where we might actually have what we call a forced oscillation, some outside force coming into the system and pushing on it in a particular way. And instead of just pushing all at once at some point, imagine if that force were continuously pushing and it also oscillated back and forth with the system. So now let's just talk about the sum of the forces involved. But we'll have, again, we'll consider the restoring force of the spring. We will still involve resistance due to friction, air resistance friction, but we'll also then have a force on this that will be positive because it's basically adding energy to the system. It's trying to increase the size of the amplitude, that sort of thing. And we're going to make it so it's not constant, but it's going to just also oscillate with the system. But this omega here may not necessarily be the natural frequency of the system. So this is just the angular frequency of that applied force in this case. Now again, you can see that this is a differential equation. This is not going to be easy to solve at all. But you're going to find that, again, if you wanted to, you could plug in the solution I'm going to show you, and you'll see the result is actually true. And that result is the following, where the position is, again, a function of time, as it should be, and is equal to the amplitude 
cosine omega t plus the phase constant, the phi. All right, well, that looks pretty darn familiar. Did we not change anything? Oh, oh, don't worry, we did. The amplitude now is much, much more complicated. So in that case now, amplitude is equal to the size of the force that we're using on that system, divided by mass, over the square root of the difference between the frequency of the force on this system minus the natural frequency of that oscillator. And that difference of those two is squared plus an effect from the resistance in that system. Now, let's take a look at this amplitude function and see what it actually means rather than it just being a math collection. You're going to see that there is a particular case that if omega and omega naught are the same, that is, if the rate that you're pushing on the system matches the natural frequency of that system, this will be zero. And since if this is zero, this is going to make the denominator as small as possible. If this were negative, because it's being squared, this would just be positive anyways. So indeed, if this is zero, we make the denominator as small as possible, which makes the amplitude as large as possible. So this sort of case, if the two frequencies are the same, is what we call resonance. And it's a, an extremely important concept in a lot of engineering. And of course, this means that if you really want to get something shaking as much as possible, you want to be in resonance. You want to be oscillating at the same frequency as the object is naturally. Of course, this also means that if you are way, way, way off the natural frequency, you can pretty much, you know, have almost no amplitude in there. There will still be this term, of course, so it won't be the case that if you make this term as large as possible that the whole thing will just kind of go away, but it's going to be very hard to get any significant amplitude. One other thing, though, is what if you had the natural frequency and the forced frequency to be the same, and B became very small, if there was very little resistance, and this became had little or no dampening. Well, then you would see that this denominator is approaching zero. And what happens if you are dividing by zero? Well, you know that this value is going to basically explode. And this is pretty much when everything goes really bad. If you don't have enough dampening, and the resonance then gets out of control, and it'll probably break what you're working on, because the oscillations go up to infinity. That's a bad day. And unfortunately, this sort of thing has happened in the real world. Not necessarily blowing up to infinity, but getting very out of hand.